Dear friends, it is an honor to stand before you to welcome you all to this gathering. Any academic event becomes distinguished in the presence of eminent scholars, and this is one such occasion where we will have the opportunity to hear, engage, and discuss themes that will direct our understanding and practices of learning. I'm grateful to the Kerala Council for Historical Research for choosing our university and department as a venue for holding this web lecture. The association with KCHR is a long one, and we have continuously drawn from its resources, both academic and financial. We may recall the seven-day international online workshop on sensing the past, thematic departures, and archival searches that we held from 30th September to 31st October 2020. The workshop was not only funded by KCHR, but was honored by the presence of both the chairperson, Dr. Michael Karagin, and director, Dr. G. Arunima, who made their erudite presentations. The KCHR has continuously supported the research scholars in the department, not only through fellowships, but in providing academic mentorship as well. We look forward to such partnerships in the future and hope that this lecture will be a valuable addition to this relationship. Professor D. Arunima, director of KCHR, needs no introduction. She's a professor of women's studies at JNU and is currently on deputation at KCHR, where her leadership is taking the council to new heights. Let me heartily welcome Dr. T. Arunima, chair of this session, to this gathering. <laughs> Dr. Michael Karagan, chairperson of KCHR, is a path-breaking scholar in his Kerala history and has been instrumental in setting the tone of research and writing on Kerala's past. A warm welcome to Dr. Michael Karagan, who will inaugurate this public lecture. <laughs> Professor V. Sanel, Professor of Humanities and Social Sciences at IIT Delhi, and currently scholar in residence at KCHR, is a distinguished scholar who has made deep inroads into the philosophies of knowledge making. And I deem it a privilege for both myself and the department to be welcoming you to this event. I am grateful that you accepted this invitation to be here and speak to us. Warm welcome, sir. I welcome my colleagues who together helped build the department's academic environment and especially welcome Dr. Susan Thomas, Executive Committee Member of KCHR, and my colleague at the department who will propose the vote of thanks. Research scholars and postgraduate students of the department are the backbone of all our endeavors, and I welcome them to this lecture. I extend my hearty welcome to research scholars, faculty members of other departments, as well as from outside the university, and all well-wishers who are gathered here to make this event a success. I welcome the members of the KCHR who are here today. I welcome also the audiovisual team from Creovision and end by welcoming you all to this wonderful session that I so look forward to. Thank you. Professor G. Adunima, Professor Samuel, Professor Shiva Train, Professor Susan Thomas, Friends. Um, I'm certainly happy and I feel privileged to inaugurate this uh, lecture, public lecture, by Professor Sani, who is right now working with this KCHR as a scholar in the His credentials for making this lecture, I don't have to dwell too long. We, all of you must be knowing about his work. He has already established as a unique scholar, looking at some of the issues which were not dealt with in scholarly studies, not only in Kerala, but also all over India. In fact, the subject that he is going to deal with, uh, the title itself, uh, called Amateur uh, Curiosity, Passion, and Politics. 
I'm sure that this issue must have come up uh, to each one of you. Whenever you take up an issue, take up a subject for deeper analysis or even research. There are people who cut across the horizon as if they knew all along the right answer, but never dwelt in that subject. But all of a sudden, somebody appears, somebody says something, uh, uh, something very public, something very profound also, and keep the scholars, keep the professionals, uh, really looking a bit dumb. They've been studiously working on a particular stream, a particular methodology, hoping that they would reach the answers to the questions that they were at that moment working on. Then comes this flash in the pan, and it doesn't remain in the pan, it goes all over. And a uh, person who has absolutely no uh, background in the subject, in the academic subject that, uh, that handles this issue. Where, where does this kind of spirit, where does this, this kind, of, kind of curiosity or awareness come to people? This is always, to me, has always surprised me, uh, and I'm sure that Professor Sanu will discuss this in greater detail. And in the abstract, he has already said that he will be citing some Indian examples. In my field, and my field being the subject in which I'm being working and for which I'm a student, uh, basically history of Kerala, there was a person like that, uh, Professor Shivashandar, uh, no, he's not a professor, he's, a, he's, a, he's an engineer, an engineer from Kishore, uh, Shivashandar in uh, Sudan. Whether you agree with him or not, he's, he's got at least five or six of the writings, primarily on the city of Sudan. Uh, and some of the questions that you have raised is um, really disturbing the academic world. Um, in fact, it, it can be, it can be uh, described as a gadfly, not in a demeaning manner, a gadfly on the neck of a, of a buffalo. Um, sometimes disturbing the Buffalo to 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 move his head. Primarily because of the he, he scratches or he hurts the ex, the vital questions that is going to be asked in the uh, asked by both the professionals as well as the ordinary people. Now I got a feeling uh, <laughs> I'm making the fundamental mistake of suggesting an addition to the title, the Professor Simon, we should have also included uh, passion, politics, as well as a dissatisfaction with what is happening in academics in, in professional work. Because people feel that, you know, the professionals are doing a very bad show, that the, the work is shown, I've got the answers, so he comes up or she comes up with uh, is all. So I would say that the desperateness of a, of a amateur should also be taken into account. I'm not suggesting this as a, as a victim, but I thought you know, I should uh, be uh, uh, aware of this. As a, I mean, I'm also supposed to be a professional historian. At least I use history to make my living. Uh, and use the methodology and other, uh, other uh, symptoms of historical research as my guide. Now, um, 
asking this question by um, any scholar is a is a is a welcome. Now this should have been asked quite a long time ago. It should have been discussed by many other people because already uh, amateurs, whoever they are, uh, I myself cannot cannot define a amateur. But amateurs have already made their mark in the realm of um, academic or uh, uh, many research areas. So this aspect of uh, why they come and why they make an impression and, and, and why they leave also. Some of them come and make their answers and they, they, they leave. Now, this phenomenon has been uh, uh, there, and why it was not discussed so far, uh, very, very, people might have mentioned this, but uh, they have not discussed it in the deeper sense as it required uh, so far. That is my personal opinion. I'm happy and I'm profoundly uh, thankful to Professor Salim, who is uh, the, uh, his ability to analyze such issues, such uh, 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 issues of not the normal kind of issues. Normally, a philosopher or a historian do not, or a social scientist uh, do not look at these issues um, all of a sudden. But uh, Professor Sanon has got the way and the method and also the clarity of thought is already established by his own words. I uh, welcome him, I thank him on behalf of the KCHR as well as the uh, Department of History, the Sandalite and the Sanskrit University, with which the KCHR finds it a pleasure and the, and, uh, and the privilege to associate in various programs, as Dr. Shiva has already mentioned, and we hope that that link, that uh, collaboration will continue. I once again make uh, a public statement saying that this lecture is in Thank you. Thank you, Professor Peregrin, for uh, inaugurating uh, this um, public lecture by Professor Sandeep. Uh, on behalf of KCHR, um, uh, I mean, I second what Professor Peregrin has already said. We are delighted to be here in SSU's gallery uh, and also collaborating with the Department of History, with which we have very strong ties. Uh, I want to personally thank uh, Dr. Shiva and Dr. Susan Thomas, uh, with whom I have the very fond and close connections. Other than that, they are also on the EC of the KCHR. Um, before uh, we start today's lecture, I want to briefly tell you about what the Scholar in Residence program is about, and also introduce Professor Sanil. Um, which is that the Scholar in Residence program is an invited uh, uh, sort of fellowship at the KCHR for a period of three months. So we invite dis distinguished scholars uh, who come and are in Tarandam or in Pataram with us for three months. It's a period where they pursue an area of research of their choice. And we enable that. The idea is that scholarship should be made, you know, the context of doing scholarship and scholarly work, whatever it might be, should be as enabling as possible. And uh, we try in our small way to do that, and that's what the Scholarly Residence Program is about. We have been very lucky this year. We were very lucky to have two scholars in residence. Uh, our first collaboration was uh, with NG University for a similar lecture when Dr. Vijay Raghi from uh, Hyderabad University History Department came. And we are so grateful that Sunil could find the time to come and be with us for three months. Uh, he's uh, a 
professor in the Department of uh, Humanities and Social Sciences at IIT Delhi. Now, for those of you, and especially young students who uh, may not know Sandal's work personally, many of you may, because Sandal writes, um, unlike certainly myself, in both Malayalam and in English. And his choreography, which came out last year, uh, is an outstanding set of uh, essays on um, themes, such wide themes as literature, art, cinema, and abstract thought. His training is in the area, and he's actually originally a mechanical engineer from what is now called the, um, what is it called? The engine, what used to be called the Regional Engineering College, and it's called the uh, College of, no, CET, Tarandum. Uh, and, um, and in fact, he worked briefly at the DRDU in Bangalore, and um, then, uh, fortunately for us, left that and moved away to do a PhD in philosophy at IIT Kanpur. His um, main areas are in the uh, sort of fields of Western philosophy, particularly Heidegger, Wittgenstein, and many other Germans whom we, most of us find impenetrable. Uh, I must say that I have personally benefited enormously in my long and close association with Sunny for almost three decades uh, in reading and talking and hearing him speak and teach. Um, I find that uh, it is actually very profitable to have conversations across boundaries, even though we speak about interdisciplinary research, there is a great strength in being grounded in our disciplines. But equally, there's great strength in being creative and um, playful about it. I find that um, Sandy's work really represents that. It's a deeply intellectual, very rigorous form of thought, which is irreverent and playful. That's not easy. Uh, so we look forward enormously Sandy, to this talk on amateur curiosity, passion, and politics. Welcome. Dear friends, thanks. So allow me to thank uh, Professor Shiva, uh, Professor Susan, and colleagues uh, at the History Department for uh, giving me this opportunity. Uh, to talk to you, and also thank you, uh, Professor Arunima and Professor Tarakan and the team from KCHR, uh, who has uh, made my stay here as uh, uh, scholar in residence uh, extremely engaging and uh, fruitful uh, for uh, me. And uh, so when I speak if you have any unclarity at any point, just stop me there. We don't have to go to the end of the talk. Uh, so just please feel to stop me. And uh, you know, what I want to discuss with uh, you is this question about uh, amateur uh, curiosity. Right? And uh, why we are doing it is, and uh, let me say what I want to discuss with you is just can we sketch out the idea about a knowledge seeker. Many of you are in research or going to you know, do research. A researcher uh, as an amateur. And also a certain ethics of knowledge which we want to pursue. The way in which you are going to be open to uh, research. That's the idea. And why there is an urgency of speaking about it is uh, Today, the place where knowledge is, at least we think that it's produced, uh, preserved, and also disseminated in the university. Right now, we are all very really anxious about university, because university is, can you hear me? No. So we know that university is under attack, both from the state, and also from the society, and also within itself, right? And, uh, it's no longer very really evident that not, you know, university is the site of knowledge production. Right? You'll come to that. And, uh, and also, university was seen as something which allows you a certain affordability of uh, people. That's also no question whether we need university in order to ensure this upward uh, mobility. So there is, and also, you know, there is a great hatred for the uh, university in the civil society. 
side. Right? So all these things are now with time we ask this question, what kind of actually attitudes are there? Is our mainstream thinking about an attitude of research, cognitive attitude, is it something which, or we can look at something else. And uh, at the outset I want to say there are two ways which we think about it, we want to get out of it. That's my subject. One is academic and non-academic. Right? That's not what, what I want to talk about is some real academicians. And then try to say that look, there is something strange about it. So it's not the attack. So if you take history, I think for someone like me who has the amateur interest in history of Kerala, <coughs> there are so many non-academic writers in my reading list, you know, from Bhaskar and me to Kamik Bayu, Kesari, P.K. Balarishnan, Charai, Ramdas, many of them. So it's not the big deal. We know that serious history is happening in Kerala outside the academy. There are also equally rigorous, uh, you know, attempts within the uh, university. Uh, but you know, the universities, uh, I said the strange na nature of knowledge in university is that university is supposed to be a philosophical institution, right? The highest degree in the university is doctor or philosophy, whatever will be your area of uh, research. But if you today go to a philosophy, philosophy itself strangely become a department within that. So if you go for a PhD in a philosophy department, they will tell you, well, tell us why is your problem philosophical? Right? It's very strange that you have a degree of university, which is a philosophical institution, but it says, look, there is some strange, unique, disciplinary way in which an inquiry is uh, philosophical. And this is the same way we need to ask in every history department. Why is it that the history department or the sociology department asks for a disciplinary specific criterion to define your work? At the same time, your degree is doctor of philosophy. Right? So, there is an issue which is, uh, uh, you know, happening there. And we know that, uh, and also I want to stay away from uh, another available form of looking at is the uh, question about the validity or scientific nature of, uh, you know, social uh, sciences. And we know that uh, generally the natural sciences give us a paradigm. And we social sciences want to say that either we are like them, we are just slower right now, but give us some time, we will catch up with you. Or we say, no, no, we are doing something else, so, you know, so we have a different method. Either way, I think uh, one of the symptomatic features of social science department, I'm sure all of you have a course in research methods, right? This is a course which is there only in social science departments. In no science departments have anything called research methods. In science, you do, you know, do whatever allows you to solve the problem, you use, you have techniques. But in social sciences, we think that natural sciences have this success because they have some method. So we will also try to imitate that in our discipline or come out with something different. So you say qualitative, quantitative, uh, you know, etc. So it is to, you know, get out of this idea that we, we, we just try to, can we get talk about what we are doing in university out of this kind of uh, uh, problem. And another, I think, common sensical idea about amateur we have is in contrast with the professional. Right? Professional is somebody who is doing it to make money, and amateur is somebody who is actually doing it out of love. Right? And this is fairly artificial, you know, because even though we faculty members, we all get UGC salary, and it's very important for our life, Many of us, you know, it is know that look, it's not for money that, money alone that any academic professional is really working. At the same time, I think amateurs make a lot of money in any field. Right. So this amateur professional, uh, you know, that's distinction. So let's see whether can we get out, think about this problem, this curiosity, out of the amateur professional distinction, out of the academic, non-academic distinctions, out of the, okay, so natural sciences versus, uh, social uh, sciences. So, with this introduction, uh, let me start right away with a historian around whose work I want to start this discussion. And that is uh, D.D. Kosumbi. You know about D.D. Uh, Kosumbi, a great uh, historian, someone with whom you can say a Marxist historian, but who was also a great mathematician and a statistician. And uh, uh, Roman Arthur once asked a question. 
So even though D.D. Kosambi was a historian and also a mathematician, he never wrote the history of Indian mathematics. Why did he write the, the, write the history of uh, mathematics? So uh, Romela Thapas posed that question. It's a very important question. By the way, aside, one could ask why Kosambi, who used this knowledge of mathematics to great effect in the study of numismatics, I think it's a study of poems he used, a lot of statistical. It's a very interesting work to look at. Did not combine his expertise in mathematics and history to write a history of mathematics in early India. If there was anyone in India qualified to initiate a Joseph Nidham-like project on science and civilization in India, it could have been possibly. Was it his commitment, and then Romila proposes an answer. Was it his commitment to writing a Marxist history of India founded on studies of society and economy that kept him from a history of mathematics? He thinks he is a massive, you know, a Marxist historian, so naturally he will be focusing more on economy and social structure. That's why he did it. But we find a strange answer in uh, Kosambi himself. Kosambi says, as I actually know, that Kosambi was working on extremely cutting edge mathematics of Riemannian hypothesis. He also had exchanges with Einstein. So he says this. Einstein, for all the stimulus his ideas gave to contemporary differential geometry, was not and never regarded himself as a mathematician. So my excursion, then he says about himself, say, uh, Einstein was a contributor greatly to geometry, but he always thought I am a physicist. So my excursions in the statistics, Indology, archaeology, and the rest are irrelevant unless some real mathematics emerged at the end. Alternatively, is there something wrong in the philosophy that asserts the unity of theory and practice? He says, my engagement in history is useless unless some mathematics came out of it. Right? So what is this? Expectation that he says that I am doing, he is doing history so that he can make some breakthrough in, uh, you know, mathematics. Uh, now, uh, you know, this kind of uh, mathematician, in order to make a breakthrough in mathematician, take up history writing. Right? Now, it might sound very strange, and we will come to that because that we can make sense of this situation. Uh, say, for example, if you take uh, Einstein himself, right? Einstein's, uh, we all associate theory of relativity with him, but we know that he didn't get Nobel Prize for theory of relativity, right? He got it for his work on photovoltaic cells. And why? Because a philosopher made some objections, right? Henry Bergson, right? He made some objections. And Nobel Committee thought that it was very serious objection. So there was a time when a philosopher will write on theory of relativity and that will deny a Nobel Prize to a, uh, you know. And if you take, uh, you know, history of philosophy, mathematics, examples are so many. For example, you must have heard about Descartes, René Descartes, who came out with cogito ergo sum, I think, for therefore I am, etc. Right? And you know that he was also uh, the father of coordinate geometry, analytical geometry, right? our graph papers and all that. Because uh, he was actually trying to work out the proof for the existence of God, proof for the uh, you know, uh, existence of the soul, and a certain absolutely unquestionable foundation for science. And then he works it out through coming out with a new uh, geometry. So you have a philosopher like Leibniz, who again is working on questions about the nature of law and the uh, creative God's necessity, etc then he will work out the calculus, right? He came out with calculus. And then you realize that during the time when he comes out with these mathematical theories, the mathematicians are not very excited by it, right? But he has come out with We know that in Kerala also there were initiatives in, uh, you know, uh, calculus, roughly around that time. And uh, then much later, Newton will come and then reinterpret the calculus so that now it is acceptable to uh, you know, the uh, mathematical, the world of uh, mathematics. Now, this kinds of uh, work 
I think it's very difficult to understand within what we understand as interdisciplinary research. See, our idea of interdisciplinary research is that we have to get totally grounded in the basics of one discipline. Then we will come and talk about complicated problems. Right? This is, and uh, this actually never happens, uh, you know, uh, like that. And uh, so my suggestion is that we need to think about a different kind of knowledge seeker and an ethics of knowledge in order to understand uh, these. Right? So these are the people whom I am citing, or I would like to call your attention, it's not people like Steve Jobs and all that, right? Who actually we know that uh, he didn't do proper studies, but then he came on to study. But let us take people who are right in that. So, you know, here this equation a philosopher logician Whitehead once said, we cannot keep the sciences apart, still less their objects such as physical and the mental, it's almost childish to attempt. The thing is to cut across in new ways, get your religion into your physics, and your physics into your, uh, you know, aesthetics. And, and as you know, uh, Osambi had another problem, that is, uh, he was working in India on cutting edge problems in the West, right? So colonialism was an important uh, issue for him. So this question about amateur, uh, the, when you think about the politics, we need to think about some of these nuances. So he actually once asked, could a problem over which world's greatest mathematician has come to grip for over a century be thus be cost casually solved in the jungles of India? He is working on Riemannian hypothesis. And he asked this question, is this cutting edge? How do we solve it from the jungles of India? And you know that when, uh, he published his work on Riemannian geometry. It was published in the Indian Journal of Agricultural Economics. Not in, this, not in history, but in Indian Journal of Agricultural Economics. And because of that, you know, people, you know, people you know, in DIFR where he was working, they just couldn't handle this kind of uh, uh, you know, work. So, Magna Saha finally kicked him out of CIFR because you are going and publishing. First of all, you know, you are, uh, you know, statistician, you are doing on Riemannian hypothesis, all your work is in history and you are publishing it, uh, you know, in Indian Journal of Agricultural Research. And in one of his papers, he didn't even, he knew another, he gave the name, author's name as Dukri. And Dukri in Marathi means swine pig, right? And in that paper, he acknowledges Himself, he said, look, one of the contributors is, you know, he is acknowledging DD possibly. It, what kind of thing which somebody who is trying to work in cutting edge in the jungles of India, right? So when some of you join PhD, I think let's not take what you are doing lightly. Right? If you really want to get into this knowledge making business, then this is the crazy fate which is awaiting you. So, uh, if you take these, uh, uh, you know, questions, so when you see somebody like, uh, uh, you know, Kossam or Buxton or Descartes, etc., these are not people who have any, by amateur, we don't mean that they take this question lightly. They are very serious. They are very serious about foundations in all the disciplines. But their interest is not a very disciplinary interest in the foundations of each, uh, you know, uh, disciplines. And, uh, uh, you know, for example, if you are physicists and uh, the physicists are doing quantum physics and if you ask what is the nature of, uh, you know, reality, what are these things you are talking about, then they will say that, oh, this, you know, we don't know. let us leave it to philosophers. Sometimes they might say, okay, let us leave it to the sociologists. So, what I call the amateur is an amateur is somebody who works on the borderline between we have nothing to do or better left to somebody else. Right? So in your discipline you come across this kind of somebody will tell you that look, it has nothing to do with us, or it will say somebody else will solve. Right? So we are talking about a cognitive agent who is in the borderline between them. Now, you know, if you uh, you know since I teach in an engineering institute. In engineering education, we have a very mythical knowledge uh, situation that engineering is applied science. 
that is very right idea. Very often, you know, technology comes first and science comes later. But we still let that, you know, technology is. We had great ships and after that we had artillery principles. But we think that, okay, still it's the other way around. But, uh, so we think that, you know, you know, in the plus two and all that, you have to get your maths, your science background really strong. And then you go and do engineering. But when you do engineering, you realize that the engineering problem is essentially different from a scientific problem. Right? So you need to know good science, mathematics, if you want to cut it. But you don't have to know something like foundation. You take it when you need it. Right? That's what you uh, do. So very amateur, I am, we are going to talk about somebody like this. Now, if you take biology, now today, if you take biology, you know, during COVID times and all that, most of the people who are making contributions to biology are not biologists. They are physicists, they are computer uh, scientists, uh, uh, they are statisticians, economists, they are the people who are uh, making contributions. Right? And uh, because in order to make a cutting edge contribution to biology, so you don't have to have a strong disciplinary grounding. Right? In, in this. That's not what is needed for. In fact, uh, the COVID time is the occasion where we can really see the emergence of new uh, cognitive agents because you must have heard about the, the paper which formed the basis of lockdown is the British Neil Ferguson's uh, paper on uh, non pharmaceutical methods. And you know, this paper came out in 2020 March. Right? It came out on the internet, not in any journals. It came out on the internet and it got into the policy making. Right? And uh, the paper was actually published after review only in 2020 uh, June. So here is a paper, came out, right? we think that paper should come out, our you know, reviewers should do it, and then it will get be discussed among the uh, you know, experts, and then it will be applied. But that's not what really uh, happened. Something came out into that, it hit upon people, and later it is published. So we need to notice the, the nature of the uh, knowledge making, which is uh, uh, you know, changing. And uh, another funny instance of uh, Nobel laureate amateur, which I must, you must have heard about Carrie Mullis. Uh, Carrie Mullis is the person who won Nobel Prize in 1993 for RT-PCR tests, which I'm sure all of you have done RT-PCR tests. Now, I mean, as you know, Mullis has very clearly said you shouldn't use this for any diagnosis, but we use it for diagnosis, right? And this chance of uh, testing whatever it is, diagnostic stands are 60%. Whether you want to get COVID or not, 60%. If you toss a coin, 50%. Right? But still, we did it. But it's interesting when Kennedy Mullis was working on RT PCR, in his lab, people felt that he doesn't know, he's a chemist, he doesn't know any biology, he doesn't know any uh, uh, you know, biochemistry. And six months before he got his Nobel Prize, that lab was theatrical. Corporation was seriously considering of kicking him out. And now, Carrie Mullis has already started working from home. He hated his lab, he hated his colleagues, right? And he started writing computer programs so that he can operate the lab of things from home, so that he doesn't want to come and fix, right? And now, somebody who has had this image in his lab suddenly wins the Nobel Prize and he just formed the intervention uh, pattern of. Uh, our uh, time. Uh, so the amateur, so why I'm putting this is what we are going to talk about as amateurs are people who are in the discipline, like they are working. So the amateur cannot afford to be ignorant about any specific uh, aspects in the discipline he takes on. He does read the foundational text with utmost care and master methods and techniques. However, he does not do anything as it is ought to be done or as it is meant to be done. The amateur's pursuit is not to free disciplines from their foundations, but to free foundations from their disciplinary ought. He ruthlessly pursues knowledge, but pushes the meaning of knowledge beyond the disciplinary horizon. An amateur is fascinated by the fact of knowledge. Now I want to say a few things about the epistemology of this amateur's standard. 
uh, uh, Amitra is not interested in the meaning of knowledge. He is interested in the fact of uh, knowledge, right? So in the sense, every amateur is, as Michel Foucault say, a happy positivist. Right? So you want to know what this knowledge means, etc. that you get into this, then you need a disciplinary horizon, uh, etc. An amateur is interested in knowledge in its superficial fluid, positivity. He upholds depth. And normally, when you are in a disciplinary uh, mode, the question you always ask about knowledge is about its meaning, right? That's about, about use, etc. Right? And your question always is, what are the conditions of possibility of knowledge? How is this knowledge possible? So that, you know, we are in, in scientific research, whatever theories you hold, 99% of the theories are false. Right? They all turned out to be false. The whole question is, then why do you do this science? Right? So they said, okay, but we can at least master the condition of possibility of knowledge. Now, in contrast to this, an amateur is only interested in the condition of actuality of uh, knowledge. Now, there are two ways in which you can think about knowledge in any discipline. One way is formalization, right? You develop a logic of that. Uh, you know, situation. That's what you say, you look at technology problem, formalize it into physical science, and physical science has and one more deeper level of formalization in mathematics, uh, etc. Right? Another one, as we, this is often done in natural science departments, and in social science department, we say we are interpreting it, because our data is already interpreted, we need to data, so we need to, uh, you know, interpret it. So formalization and interpretation are the two modalities of people. Now, you know, formalization and interpretation, the basic tendency if you are in this mode is that the moment you encounter a knowledge that somebody said something significant, your attitude is, I want to be on top of it. I want to say something else. Either you say that formalization means, either I will say that, okay, I can say something which refers to this sentence, for example, I say, I said, uh, uh, you know, this is black. Then you say, oh, you utter the sentence, this is black. That's the metaphor, right? So that's what, then I will formalize it. Or I interpret, oh, you said this is black. Oh, you are unconscious, something is going on. Or your economic situation made you say it is a black. Say, I try to interpret. So basically, you hear anything about knowledge and that your interest is in, okay, what is not there? Whereas an amateur is just interested in knowledge as it happens. So that's what, you know, Foucault uses this term, people who listen to the murmur of knowledge. So that's what uh, his uh, interest is. And another aspect of the uh, amateur is that the object of curiosity of the amateur is a problem or the problematic. And the milieu of the problem, that's what is interest and not the solution. Now it's a very scandalous thing, right? If you say that amateur is interested in the problem, we always say we should always ask questions. And people say about there are disciplines like you know in natural scientists always say don't go and say humanities and social sciences because there's no definite answer to anything. Right? If you come to social sciences that will go to philosophy. Oh, in social sciences we have at least some definite answer, but these philosophy guys they are all the time talking about uh, you know, problem. Uh, but I think an amateur is somebody who faces it squarely and he says, look, there is a reality which is accessible purely at the domain of problem. Right? A problem is not a negative condition that needs to be removed by finding a solution. Take one of the, uh, you know, for example, if you ask the question, you know, in philosophy, what is it? Right? Now, what is the reality corresponding to that is not that is the answer will uh, tell you. And the, the problem, we also say that problem is a kind of mental condition. You have some reality, see there is this mic here, right? People who have ability will see it. But if I have some problem, I have a mental condition. I have, I have a problem, what you say. Right? So you probably you bring, sort out your problem, then things are over. Right? Now, what the amateur is that amateur is some reality is disclosed about our reality 
is the modality of the problem, not at the level of uh, you know solution. And I think one example which you, you know maybe I can communicate is suppose if you have a moral dilemma, right, to do something or not to do you know, uh, something. Right? Now the moral dilemma when you go when you finally solve it. For example, if my moral dilemma is I am at a party, right, and whether I should have a drink or not. To have a drink or not. So finally I take a decision whatever it is, right? So when you really track back what is the problem, it's not that you have these two sentences in front of you, to drink or not to drink. And I was constantly oscillating between them. No. When you are in a moral dilemma, it is a very complex belief. It has hundred other things involved in it, right? Now, finally, when it is solved, you have a description about the situation in terms of the two horns of the dilemma. But that's not what you are when you are in the, uh, in the, in the problem as it may be. So, uh, an amateur always poses his problem in such a way that even when you hit at the answer, the answer will not trivialize the problem. When you hit at the problem, Solution, you shouldn't be asking, oh, why did have a side worry so much about the problem? Right? But the answer should be in such a way that even when you have hold on to an answer, that it is no way that it realizes the uh, gravity of the problem. So that is why, for example, philosophers often tend to uh, you know, formulate problems as paradoxes. Right? So there are so many paradoxes, ten of paradoxes that you look, I can just walk and reach you. But Seno will say, you know, there is no way you can be spared. I have to always cover half the distance. So solution is something which all of us can do. But we will ask it because there is something about space which is a reality which can only have a correlate as a problem. Okay. So uh, this is what, uh, and you know, you know, if you go to philosophy department, they are all trying to solve the problems. Right? But the whole point of the activity is that get it true problems, that's what that activity is. And I think it's a general issue, it's not about uh, you know, uh, philosophical issues. Uh, and if you look at in the history of philosophy, you will come to know that they come with very, very rigorous forms of these problems. That's what we call dialectical thinking, it's actually a science of problems. And so that analytical solutions are, we account for the analytical solutions, but you need to always have a dialectic to so give a sense of the problem. Now the epistemological orientation towards problematics can be distinguished from that of, if you say that, okay, problematics is that, and what you can distinguish it is from what we call axiomatics, right? The two ways of which you can think about your knowledge, you think one is problematics and another is axiomatics. Right? And so you can have, it's not like, research problem is not what you encounter in the first month of your until your research proposal seminar. That's not what you, uh, you know, encounter. Right? So when you, you convert that by saying that okay, you have an axiomatic. When you have axiomatics, what you actually do is you move from some necessary presuppositions or axioms to some theories. Right? Whereas when you have a problematic, what you do is you have problems, then you move towards uh, the conditions of that problem. What are the conditions of any problem which you have? And then you identify cases, typical cases where some solutions can be done. So if you take the history of geometry, you have the great tradition of Euclid, which you have, might have heard about Euclidean geometry, which is axiomatic. Okay. Then you have a parallel, you have a you know, geometry by uh, Archimedes, which is problematic. Where they show that how to do something. The problematic is all the time how to do something. It's not that when I say, you have to take problems seriously, you are always in some abstract. No. It's actually people who take the problematic seriously for them, there is always there is a problem, how to try such an angle, uh, etc. Now, uh, the, another aspect of the knowledge seeking of the, uh, I think if you feel tired, you should, I think you have your take tea with you, so you should feel free to eat while you are doing it. You are not talking me to uh, ask that question. Uh, so another is what the amateur is worried about when you are knowledge seeking. Right? So normally what you are, are worried when you are uh, 
research. You are worried about errors, right? Error is what you are worried about. Now, the amateur is not worried about error. He is worried about something more serious, and that is stupidity. Right? He just can't take stupid problems. That is what carries right? Because the error is a currency. When you are you, when you look at the history of philosophy, etc., you have people like Descartes who wanted to have absolutely certain knowledge. Then he say, okay, what are the things? I will come up with this axiomatic which will solve problems. Then I marry, what are the outside influences that will disturb my cognition? Then you have something error. You, when you think about error, you always think about something which is outside your knowledge. You will come to some real clear way of solving your problem. But let's avoid outside influences. And then you find in the history of philosophy, modern philosophy with Immanuel Kant, etc., they will say, no, there are some errors which you can't avoid if you think at all. And they are called illusions. That's where Marxist theory comes up with something called ideology. Right? These are necessary to the functioning of your, it's not like some mistake you uh, make. So uh, the stupidity is what something which is neither an error nor that an illusion, but it is the kind of faculty which creates false problems. So the, what the amateur is interested is in uh, separating true problems from uh, false problems. Now, you know, when I said stupidity, we can actually, uh, you know, give some, there are, you know, thinkers of modern technology like people like Bernard Stiegler, etc have given some content to this idea about what is the stupidity which we are facing, right? So for example, stupidity can be fortunate, probably Marx's favor as something like proletarianization of knowledge. Okay. So what happens with, you know, the word proletarian in its root, that means, uh, the root means somebody who is not really poor, somebody who cannot cultivate his patrimony, his inheritance. That's what the proletariat is. Somebody who cannot cultivate it inherently in knowledge. Like Marx talked about the alienation of the producer. But we can also think about capitalism as a proletariat. That the worker's knowledge is rendered useless. Okay. What is the, uh, the, the, the knowledge which capitalism brings about is that is the machine which knows, not the knowledge. Whatever he has learned from his life, etc., is totally useless. And whatever the knowledge something is needed on the factory floor, you have time motion studies which will tell you uh, where it is. Right? So the first stage of capitalism, we can think of it as a proletarianization of the, uh, you know, the producer. Right? All kinds of know-how, all kinds of how to live, etc., are totally rendered uh, useless by capitalism. And the next stage capitalism did was that it proletarianized the consumer. It's a whole idea about our desire, right? Desire is all future avenues are closed for desire and it is brought into some immediate satisfaction. So the, what I would mean by proletarization of desire is the, you know, the advertisement of Coca-Cola. You must have heard seen the advertisement of Coca-Cola. They say it is fun to be thirsty. Right? You are not advertising Coca-Cola by saying on a summer you can have it, but it's fun to be thirsty. So that's the way the, uh, you know, thing is short circuit. And with digital and finance capitalism, we have a general condition of proletariat. Everybody is, like stupidity is the order of the day. And that stupidity, we should see it as, don't think about it, somebody who commits error or somebody who succumbs to deception, etc. And uh, the, the real point of the COVID time was again, this idea of uh, positive, uh, stupidity for us because during the you know, COVID thing, you ask anyone who is supposed to know, a doctor, epidemiologist, oh, you don't know anything about it. Right? That's the idea. We don't know anything about it. But, oh, we will tell you what exactly is the thickness of the mask you should wear. Right? So what is the minimum distance between two human beings? So why did you learn? But we don't know anything about it. Right? So a certain public display of ignorance combined with social of thing of, uh, you know, uh, knowledge. And, you know, look, in fact, uh, the most profound statement during this COVID was 
said by our own Prime Minister, right? The most secular statement. He said, have faith in science. Right? No secularist can dispute with him on that count. And that's what happens. See, once you become your own idea about see, the COVID is the time you have such sophisticated proliferating of mathematical modeling about everything in the world. Right? All your behavior was totally in attempts were made to mathematically model. So future became hypercalculable. Right? Your future become hypercalculable and your desires are immediately short-circuited into exactly what you said. You can't say anything about big team. COVID times, you all talk about how many times to wash your hand, not about moral thing about should I lie or should I love my neighbor or you know, how many times you should wash your hands. So once you have it, right, this is the time you, there's a peculiar way in which trust now is made absolutely calculable and invested in a close horizon of uh, future. Right? And uh, this is, well, once you have it, right, once you have something like this, then the only way you can have trust in a society or you can have belief. You can talk about scientific belief. Prime Minister didn't say have belief in science. He said look have faith in science. Right? And that's what in a secularist society when this condition is done, whether you are now Hindu nationalist or a left secular secularist, all that you can have is faith. Faith is absolutely calculated trust in a close horizon of future. Right? And this I would say that this is how Stupidity has become the general condition of life. And it is here that the amateur is trying to open up a slightly long circuit of desire and a slightly open future that he is uh, looking for. Uh, the amateur picks up pieces of knowledge as a child picks up toys. The amateur enters into this dubious play, and I want to correct the, the you often say that the amateur is very playful, but we should think about our concept of studious play with rigorous forms of knowledge by suspending disciplinary justification and legitimation. In a different context, Agamben has used Benjamin's reading of Kafka's character, Dr. Bucephalus. So I thought since I studied the part, I will take this story because Bucephalus, as you know, was Alexander's coach. Now, this character is Dr. Bucephalus. The new attorney in the bar who carries the name of Alexander's great horse as a figure of the amateur. The horse Borsipolis uh, had the ability to follow the direction of the sword that pointed at the gates of India. Today there are no great emperors or great battles, and the swords are wielded for mere self the mere self aggrandizement by the powers who murder. Bucephalus is a doctorate in legal matters and has entered the bar. I think those who have read the Kafka story, you know, Dr. Willis is taking a legal degree and all that. And he is surely out of place in the bar. This new attorney withdraws into the confines of the library and, you know, I quote uh, Kafka, free his plans, untrust by the thighs of a rider, under the quiet lamp from the din of Alexander's battle, he reads and turns pages of the old books. So think about, this is the figure of the amateur. Alexander's horse, right, later takes a doctorate degree, comes to a legal bar, and he doesn't go to the court, but gets in the legal library and decide to endlessly read the legal uh, text. Here, Dr. Bosopoulos is reading law in a world where the law has lost its guiding power, the sword. The sword is no longer showing the direction of the great conquest by great kings seated on galloping war horses. The law resides in the book of law, the constitution. One may indeed say that law has finally come to its own power and can rule without the power and guidance of the sword. This is the power of the law that one can engage with in a library other than endlessly interpreted, is there, what is this power of law that one can engage with in a library other than endlessly interpreting the law? For Benjamin, the violence creates and preserves the law. Benjamin criticized the law's claim to be the authority to distinguish between legitimate and illegitimate violence. As we know, you know, people like Walter Benjamin said, you often think about law or something to control violence, but we know that law itself is uh, generated in, in, in violence. Right? 
So, what is this course which was leading one of the greatest violent battles as we taken a law in law degree and doing it in the legal library? Right? And Sir Benjamin is suggesting that he is actually developing a violence, a divine violence which can actually cut the violence of the uh, law creating uh, violence. Right? Now, he uses it in very, very uh, theological terms, but at some point he also the various of human beings this violence is available. And he says this violence is available in the power of education. Right? Now, what I'm saying is when we talk about amateur, we say it's very playful and all that, but we should, when it comes to the political context, we should think about it as, for example, how is the amateur is taught in a classroom, right? So what is the divine violent power that can be brought into the classroom? Now we can't today talk about violence in the classroom at all. We are all very nice, gentlemanly teachers. We don't teach up our teachers, students, right? We don't uh, hold our teachers, right? But if you want to talk about amateur, we need to bring in a certain question to the violence, to the violence into the classroom. So let me just address one. Traditionally, education is ritualized learning following rituals of obedience, reverential repetition, testing, etc. As Socrates says, children must be subjected to labor, pain, and contest. These are the things to, students should be subject to, like labor, pain, and contest. However, when it comes to the teaching of subjects that pertain to the development of free citizens, Socrates proposes play. Free citizens should not learn like a slave. Play here is not a pedagogical aid or a sugar coating, it is a specific kind of relationship with knowledge. Traditionally, toys are remnants of past rituals. Play breaks with the ritual. For Benjamin, education is pure transmission, but freed from the authority of the myth. The task of the teacher is to neither set himself as an example or make the student imitate him, nor impose his authority on the student. The teacher exercises his mastery not on the student, but on the activity of transmission. The teacher's mas mastery lies in preserving the asymmetry of the scene of education, whereby the potential for learning is always in excess of what is being taught. Instruction here is the act of anarchic violence. So the, the, the what the teacher actually, a teacher's job in the classroom is pure transmission of knowledge. Now what I am trying to suggest is that the pure transmission of knowledge, right, and this is what the, the amateur is only interested in out of his love. He is not interested in use and all that, right. To get at the handle, we need to think about what teachers have done. Now we think that we shouldn't say this, we shouldn't purely tra you know, transmit knowledge, etc. to students. You are all, there is a fetishization of creativity in the classroom. We have to all the time teach people, make people to think separately. Right? So when we are giving up this foundation thing, I want to bring it back to the violence, necessary violence uh, in the uh, classroom. And this is the anarchic vibe. What the teacher situates is that the teacher creates a situation where the possibility of learning is always in excess of whatever it is. Did you give me a pure example if I want to teach someone that this is a knife? I point my finger at this point. It is a teaching situation only if the student can actually look at my shoulder and say this is the mind. Right? So that the teacher what creates is create a situation where the learning potential is in excess of the uh, actual. Yeah. Anarchic violence in instruction is the core of education. Introduction, uh, instruction is like a seed to which the student, the wave, surrenders in such a way that it crests and breaks with it. The aim of instruction is to make the student experience knowledge as trans transmissible, to individuate it, individuate it in such a way that it becomes lived knowledge and the student becomes a teacher who in turn continues the transmission. Such a playful violence of a teacher who is a pragmatic figure for a paradigmatic figure of an amateur he reminds us about Socrates' characterization of philosopher as a midwife. In fact, Socrates allows the philosopher or the teacher as a midwife. That's an interesting thing because a midwife 
is not bringing out his own child out, right? It's somebody else's child, right? So the midwife has an interest in birth, which is pretty detached uh, from the, the the midwife has no interest in perpetuating her own legacies, right? But she is intimately involved in a childbearing uh, situation. So all these things could be my own images. I would like to suggest to get at this, how do you train an amateur and the necessary violence of the, uh, which we need in the uh, classroom. So the amateur has had a very complicated history. Today we place him in opposition to the professional. The amateur pursues an activity out of love by a professional does it for remuneration. However, in 17th century France, the word amateurat, from which amateur comes, was a figure of nobility who pursued art out of love. He marked the individuation of the newly emerging bourgeoisie public sphere on the side of monarchy. Let me just summarize it. The 17th century, the amateurat was somebody who, see that's the time museums are coming out and everybody is getting into uh, art making, painting, right? So there is this figure which is uh, somebody from the monarchy, somebody from the royal side, who is now actually instructing people about what is, how art is done. Art has some noble value, it is all the Philistines who are coming out, shouldn't be doing it, right? So, this is the original figure of the 17th century amateur. He is doing it out of love. He is, he is sponsored by the authority. He is a figure of the authority. But he is just trying to tell people that, look, there is something there in the work of art, which is neither the traditional quotes nor like everybody's thing. So you will find when uh, uh, museums like, Louvre, you know, the Louvre Museum is open. Today when you go to, to not today, at least 20 years ago, if you, you know, you went there, people will go there and we will put our hands in our pocket and watch the painting and say, it's all interesting. Now we don't do it, we go there with our mobile phones and we don't even look at the painting, we just take selfies and decide to see it, uh, you know, later. But earlier, there are a few days where the people were allowed into the, the museum, you will find this amateur going there and simply copying the paintings, right? So he was gaining a certain kind of mastery, a certain kind of cognitive thing to the painter, right? So people go to the museum and try to copy. Now this copying, the amateur actually who is copying, he doesn't want to become a uh, painter. He knows that his paintings are imperfect, right? But he's doing it there in order to bring out something which is genuinely lovable in the painting, and it has to be communicated to the new Philistine who is actually, uh, you know, emerging. And then, you know, after French Revolution, this uh, situation will uh, change. And uh, uh, a new, uh, after the French Revolution, the cultivated Philistine emerged as a bourgeoisie uh, amateur. This new figure has made possible and this view, now the, what happens is you also have the recordings, phonographs, etc., which are coming out. Until then, you know, you have people like even Bartok saying, if you knew how to, if you are interested in music, you also knew how to produce music. Right? You had at some point, you had some idea about some, uh, you know, uh, instrument, etc. Now, with the phonograph, etc., you have a new listener who is, who doesn't play any music at all, right? So he is the Philistine. And for him, you will say everything is interesting. He can actually love classical music without identifying any swaras, ragas, etc. You have, he has this, everything is likable in a, uh, in a sense, right? And this is where it becomes a very stupid, uh, you know, practice. And it is against this that you will now become amateur revolutions within. You know, you have a great text by Roland Barthes called the Musica Practica, where he look at what are people doing when they listen to, uh, you know, music once these recording devices, uh, etc., coming in. And he says somebody like Beethoven is a great music composer because he now changes the nature of music conduction in such a way that it is now you you don't just go there and read what the 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 
listener of a modern music composition right, should be able to read that composition the way he will read a book. How do you read a book? A book has you know indexes, it has page numbers, it has chapters, etc. Right? So there is an idea about the author, but it is presented in a technological device, a certain medium by which a reader has a certain freedom. Right? He has a certain minimum competence in handling it. So one thing which people like you know, Beethoven did is that he took the concert out of the concert hall and made it into a stage. It's like what you have is several instruments are just conducted. Right? So you need a competent uh, you know, listener who will rearrange it in some manner which is you know, similar to what you do with a book. Right? So this is, the, this is now a new uh, you know, amateur act will be emerged. And now this new amateur will now have a great history now in the history of jazz music where both the musician and the uh, listener will have ability to improvise, uh, you know, etc. So this amateur interest, here what I, the point I wanted to make is that the amateur interest is very much due to this new medium in which this is emerged, right? The book or the, uh, the museum, uh, the phonograph which is emerging, today the internet is emerging. And if you really, an amateur is somebody who created new practice in this new medium which is when a new something is made possible to uh, us. Right? And it's not that we have to now go and learn the ragas or you should be able to identify swaras, etc. But there is another cognitive practice which can be done, which can be transmitted, etc. has to be created. Now compare you ask with the search engines which you have in the thing, you know. You take something like, if you want to give an example, if somebody asks me, human stupidity today, and that's YouTube. Right? There is so much of music and things available, but do you have anything which is even remotely like a book content list there? Right? Which you have an intelligent classification of what is there on YouTube, nothing. Right? And the search engines, you know that the, how funny is you order three books and then they, it will tell you what are the books you will read and you feel ashamed of yourself, right? Here is a machine which actually cognitively look at my preferences and, you know, say what it is, right? So, this is where, today what is an amateur? An amateur is somebody who will actually look at what an amateur had did in 17th century, after French Revolution, what he did there, so he has to do something with the medium and say that we can have an intelligent life a non-stupid life on the, uh, you know, uh, internet. How many, how many? So uh, now, once this question about the technology is, uh, or the medium is involved, I just also want to make a suggestion that the nature of the passion of this amateur, right? How do we understand this whole idea that amateur is doing something just out of love? And my suggestion is that we should just interpret it as love for what? Right? And amateur practice is in love for oneself. And I think today it's, it's a very candidate person. We only are supposed to love others, right? And it is always selfish, infinitely open to the other and all that stuff. But amateur practice first causes us a challenge to think narcissism again, right? So when I say narcissist, right? An amateur is, you will say that the professional, your non-amateur people are always interested what is happening in the discipline, what are the unresolved problems there, how do I make sense to everyone, etc. But you will find the amateur acting on it with a totally self-engrossed manner. Right? Now, we need to understand this self-engrossed manner, uh, this attitude, which is different from egoism and selfishness. That's the task. Right? That is, it's a certain way in which primordially we are opening to ourselves, which is prior to every opening I have towards others. Right? It is a certain way in which I am open to myself even before I see myself in the mirror. Right? 
and it is by which I can even get minimally fascinated by my own image. And so, and there is a concept for us which we don't have time to develop it, which is the Freud's idea about primary narcissism, right? The primary narcissism of the child which is prior to its own. It is only at the secondary level that I recognize, so oh, I am so different from others, I should love myself, I should pursue my interests, etc. And uh, since we don't have time to discuss, I just want to just identify who are the great primary narcissists according to Freud. Freud, the primary narcissists are women, children, great criminals, cats, humorists, and philosophers. Right? There is something which all of them uh, share. It's for us to uh, do it. And uh, about cats, he has a description. The cat takes pleasure in himself with a voluptuous feeling of its own force. He grants nothing in return. Right? So there is a voluptuous feeling of its own force and the self engrossed nature of the, the cat. And I think that's the best for us to understand is when in Tom and Jerry cartoons, right, people have analyzed this, they, before the cat will jump across, you will have this precipice between two walls, and it jumps, and before falling, it has a moment of smiling. Right? And that's what I this non foundational feeling of one's own. And this is something which uh, you know we could uh, develop. And what in the next five minutes and quickly some contemporary pretty scandalous instances of this amateur practice. Like I just have done to just uh, read very quickly through two of them. Uh, they are very problematic cases. It's not that we have any way to approve them or non-approve them or anything. But just to get at what is going. The first instance I want to discuss is a department which came up in the Indian Institute of Information Technology, Hyderabad. This was a department called the Department of Exact Humanities, right? By Narjodi Singh, who is uh, no longer uh, there. Another one which is I wanted to discuss is a project of deorientalization, which is done by a set of scholars of Kuembu University under again the notorious name Baladadara. I'm sure you must be uh, familiar uh, with them. And Baladadara, there was a case was raised against his, uh, his comments on uh, Ambedkar, and apparently he was. Uh, I think even lost his job, I don't know exactly, in Ghent University, which uh, he had. The sheer novelty of their projects and the non-acceptance by mainstream academia are good enough reasons to give them a serious hearing. More importantly, both projects figured on cognitively serious cultural difference between India and West, because we also need a template to look at this curiosity today in times of, because See, the colonialism also was a lot of things. The word curiosity, when we talk about, we generally think that's a good thing. It's not. Curiosity is a very nosy affair. You are actually meddling it into the affairs of others. Right? So there has to be a restraint on uh, you know, curiosity. And many of you, there is in one of the interviews, Foucault celebrates curiosity, and he says curiosity means care. Right? The, the, the Latin word from which Curiosity of the curiositas actually also have the root to the cura, which is cure, right? So you should think about this curiosity as something here. That obviously you have to distinguish it from what is nosy getting into other people's, uh, you know, uh, life. And then the Greek had a better grip on this when the Greek had something like concept like a uh, polyprognosene, actually means a kind of reckless interest in everything else, right? And they also had another concept of atrachmosen. And pragmosen means, the, the poly pragmosen means that a reckless hunter behind everybody's thing, right? Whereas atrachmosen means that uh, you don't have uh, a restrained interest in others. And you will find in Greek society, in many places, the I'm practicing a valorized because that's the way you get concerned about the affairs of the state, right? And you will find the Socrates was accused by, I think he's on wise by saying that he doesn't get, he's just interested in the ideal city 
right? And he doesn't go and create big ruckus. He doesn't get into, you know, the vivadals, the debates in there. Today we know the way in which we live, you know, the EC. So there has to be some way in which we should think about this uh, thing, uh, you know, the curiosity. So let me quickly read the part from Navjyoti Singh. Navjyoti Singh's idea of endowment of Indian intellectual traditions and the Kuwambi University scholars' refusal to acknowledge the caste questions have invited both intellectual and institutional opposition. We shall not go into these debates. However, their presence in the Indian scenario does deserve our acknowledgement. These initiatives illustrate the idea of amateur we have been discussing in this paper. Uh, according to the, the Exact Humanities Department website, the department aims to explore definitiveness and exactitude in human beings, human conduct, human relations, and the resulting society and civilization. Humanities is a body of knowledge that deals with conceptual insights into human affairs. Exact humanities equates itself in the transdisciplinary influence between humanities and computer science. The confluence areas were ontological engineering, cultural informatics, and developmental engineering. And uh, since we don't have time to, I just give you some of the student projects there. Generative ontology of Vaisheshika system, poetry analyzer, a software to analyze poetry. Uh, qual qualificatory property, styles and icons in Indian painting, legal theory of land acquisition, theory of photography as arts and aesthetics, ontology of parliamentary debates, improvised sequence generator for Indian classical music and understanding expressions of bias in media and overcoming it. These projects do not seem to fit the familiar dichotomy between qualitative and quantitative research while staying away from narrative modes of understanding and statistical guessing games, they pursue the formal ontological investigations of human affairs. Unfortunately, we don't have any clear statement on the nature of exact humanities, but from scattered writings, I just want to formulate three. Exact humanities questions the divide between natural and social sciences. It interprets the idea of exactness, often thought of as an essential uh, feature quantifiable natural and uh, essential feature of quantifiable natural sciences in such a way that it could cover both humanities and social sciences. Humanities as a reflective conceptual knowledge and human affairs also encompasses social sciences. Second, the revision of idea of exactness starts with the re-evaluation of the link between mathematics and physics. We think of mathematics as dealing with mental ideas and reason and physics with physical universe closed under causal conditions. Namjodi Singh argues that Indian mathematics dealt with mental or numerical causation. Hence, the call to revisit Indian formal traditions to overcome prevalent oppositions between causes and reasons, quantity and quality, that maintains the distinction between mathematics and sciences, physical sciences, social sciences, and also between humanities and social sciences. So what he actually does is that some of these prevalent oppositions he takes and he goes into traditional Indian philosophy, logic, metaphysics, etc. in order to attempt specific solutions to these problems. Now there is no valid legitimization of Indian technology, philosophy as or Indian thing or big deal which is not there, nor there is an attempt to legitimize Indian tradition by saying they are scientifically useful nor an attempt to say that, you know, science and technology is going in a very bad way, but you need things from Indian, uh, you know, uh, tradition. The reference to Indian mathematical and analytical traditions indicate a trajectory of decolonization of knowledge, which differs from the critical impulses of post-colonialism. The idea of exactness tracks the history of uh, knowledge through the pre-critical pre thinking of both East and West. So what happens is that, before the threshold of this distinction between East and West, right, there was a history of engagement between the East and the West. From there, right, we can track resources from there in order to track questions in modern technology, mathematics, grammar, politics, uh, you know, etc. So here you will find that somebody working on contemporary problems gets into Indian traditions in a very localized manner in order to uh, look at situations. 
right? Now, in order to do that, you have to, if you really look at, by, okay, here is a scientific problem, we will give you a solution from India, we will laugh at it because Western scientific problems have very good solutions in the West itself, right? So what he actually opened up is that this question as a field of problematic, a field of problems which also include the question about, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the question about the, the problematic ones, and then look at Indian tradition, East West, etc., as specific, uh, you know, uh, solutions. So you will find now we don't have time to go into the Balaganga tradition of questioning and the caste question uh, in a similar uh, manner. But there also you will find that there is a critique of colonialism, right? and the critique of colonialism is done by invoking. Right? But they are not saying that there is anything called Indian experience or Western experience. But the whole question they ask is. How could the West tell so much of false things about us and take themselves seriously? The West had so many false things about the East, but took those falsehoods seriously. How could the science do that? Now, in order to do that, we need to have now a meta theory about whatever the West has said about uh, the East. Right? Only after that meta theory, we will again talk about Indian tradition, Indian experiences, uh, you know, etc. So all these scholars, what we find, they are very problematic, right? So, you know, they are immediately appropriated by the uh, right-wing nationalist uh, uh, readings and they are also being pitched against the question about Dalit politics, etc. But I think that is precisely the reason we should uh, go there because we shouldn't now think about the notion of amateur curiosity within our familiar agreed upon conventions. But even these people are opening up a way of looking at, say, a question about Indian tradition without quoting slokas and without going into which Indian uh, tradition, but specific point which can be clubbed into this, which in my opinion, uh, you know, goes beyond what I said about the traditional thing about how we're looking at in terms of grant prop, you know, formalizations or, uh, you know, uh, interpretation. So, uh, this is something which I mean by the amateur curiosity, right, and uh, uh, we didn't get much to talk about the care aspect, how did the amateur care, but I think it gave some sense about what. And if you can get out of it by the idea that the amateur is something which is like a hobby, right? something more than a hobby is the amateur is doing, I think that was my thing. Thank you. Thank you, Zanil. Um, I'm sure there are enormous numbers of questions. Uh, so the floor is now open uh, for questions. Uh, may I request that people keep their questions as questions, small and pointed. Uh, that will give us an opportunity to collect more. Um, thank you. And if you could just raise mm -hmm. It's good, even though there is nothing like good and bad. So, I am a research student, so professionally I am a research student, but uh, I do like art. I usually do art, so the question will be empty, sorry. Uh, uh, so, I used to do art, this is something that I do out of, of love. Uh, I, can, I can do drawings from dawn to dusk. And as you said, I used to go to the places and I do draw. Uh, and I noticed that the most of the drawings that I've done carry some sort of political importance. So my question is the curiosity about a topic. So I construct this uh, you know, discussion. I, I consider myself as an amateur. So the curiosity about the topic, the uh, stimulated, uh, stimulated by the evidence that has potential value, or is it is it uh, is it something that you know, uh, you know something that out of love, or is it some something that stimulated by evidence that it has some potential value? So this is my question. Yeah, I think 
Your advisor is nature in uh, taking up new issues and problematizing them, uh, which many of the people uh, may feel there is no need to, to problematize. Problem like you do uh, it in, in, in many occasions in your Malayalam work, Korea, Korea, and uh, here I also feel that. Uh, if you uh, give training and uh, promote uh, amateurs, they can bring about radical results and revolutionary changes. And this, if we, if we look at uh, many fields, this amateur curiosity is very high in literature uh, and uh, philosophy, uh, like we witnessed it in Kerala. And where uh, anyone can uh, raise his opinion, anyone can write no, short stories and uh, novels and uh, poems. Uh, there, uh, the experts cannot show you the sort of disciplinarity and talent and you are free to uh, carry it. And uh, by, uh, as a result, there are uh, many wonderful works. Uh, like uh, NS, NS Mahal and Malayal Revolution, they are doing better than those who are who, are, who, who got training in literature department, in Malayal department. And I think uh, uh, this is my uh, story. Thank you, Eddie. Um, you know, I was also struck by the tradition of what, according to your description, I think of Kerala amateur practice, uh, but there is an interesting other history to it, isn't it? Which is all these spaces of so called secondary knowledge production, which are supposedly within the university, is something very new, and I'm not so sure whether it's even taken that seriously in the Kerala context. Uh, most of the people, if you're thinking about the early decades of the 20th century, certainly in the 50s, but even after that, uh, the way we know them is two forms of writing that actually have an immense place. The people who read them may or may not be academics, it's irrelevant. But the fact is that there is something about an intervention to writing. I'm thinking of people like Tegi Varashu, who have been infinitely formative for so many people, uh, you know, whether you are politically active, so you're within that kind of journey, uh, you're a thinker, you're a cultural figure, or you are people within academia who encounter him in that context. Right? So, uh, and I think there is also a very interesting uh, other institutional history here, which is a parallel politics. So whether you think, say, somebody like M.P. Paul, you know, Paul's college was known as one of the most important places of teaching, the parallel politics. Right? So, so there is a very interesting other history there which we may want to think about in relation to this business about uh, what being an amateur is and what that amateur practice might be. So that's one thing and so I, I go with Eddie on that. The second is a slightly different kind of question, so I don't want to club it here. It's about the debate that has happened within history uh, on you know what kind of historical knowledge is accurate for thinking about the past and that came in the context of the Hindu world debates from the 80s onwards, from the Babi Masjid and Ram Janmahumi movement, this idea that uh, you know, non-practicity does not produce uh, good history. Now, this is being said by historians who themselves have great skepticism about fact. So there is a great dilemma within this, within the domain of history. Even though everything that doesn't work is thrown onto the other in terms of a non ability to comprehend the past through these methods. Right? So I think there is something troubling there uh, from both sides of the equation which might be actually worth dwelling on more. You know, what happens when you have political crisis and you are called upon 
to evaluate why you are say, what you are saying is actually far more credible and might be a more authentic grounds for articulating certain forms of narrating the past as opposed to another form. So, so these are the two things that I have. That's why we need to look at, that is my own, we need to look at the mainstream who are in the academy and say that, look, you can open up. Because any great mathematicians are the examples of coming here. They are people who really come out with things. But in the history of mathematics, they were we really, they, their entire effort will be written. It's like in the history of, you know, because they said we wanted to try to do in mathematics. Slowly we will hear it, and then his he will be okay, but not the great historian, super marketing historian, who enabled us to build up the growth of knowledge. So my idea is whether we can cut that and okay, we saw that the ultimate thing is we have to do it in our classroom. There's no way to tell them that okay, what that we are doing in the classroom is very orthodox, but you guys all have to be very creative. We can't just tell them. It has to be a certain way these people can be opened up in. That's what, uh, that's why I think people like Paul and I think, you know, that all in art also we say that, okay, in the university we can't do all these things. So we don't want to get into this celebration of the Shishya tradition and all that, okay. It can be done in the class. Only thing is that we have to really locate what I try to do. There's an anarchic violence in the class between the students. And there's a certain way in which the students the teacher creates enough chaos in the classroom so that the student is thrown against this wave of knowledge and he gets crushed in. And that has to be created in the, in the classroom. 
Still, uh, so out your uh, presentation, you talked about numerous binary, mm -hmm. professional, amateur, science, and social sciences, and uh, you know, even in terms of contemporary and tradition, you talked about the exact sciences. Uh, and um, you know, so my question is, in your, in, there is there is an interest that you should, you have shown on one side of the binary in terms of the amateur, taking sides to the amateur and trying to talk for the amateur and placing the amateur in, in the center of your discussion. So uh, my question is, you know, if we are trying to move beyond binary and we are trying to occupy a certain kind of uh, intermediate space, is there an emancipatory potential that you see in this whole exercise of bringing the amateur into the forefront? And same thing, especially when you, in terms of, you know, thinking about, you know, uh, Dalit history, women's history, and trying to move beyond the qualitative, quantitative dichotomy. Is there an interest that you have uh, in trying to inhabit the space of the connection? Another question about the binaries. I think what I was trying to say that he can take it as binary. He say amateur versus professional, academy versus non-academy, natural sciences versus social sciences. My plea was that let us not address the question of amateur in terms of these binaries. For that, we take up people who are, um, say, for example, the origin of amateur himself was actually uh, on the side of the royal. He was paid by the royal. So, so that's what we uh, in some sense, uh, possible. And he took up cases partly within academics so that you know if they won't become outside uh, practice. So that that's the way I think we should. So I agree with you. I will only use these binaries as places where you should stay here and then we can develop it. So that amateur becomes, the amateur can also earn money and he can meet the academy. And the question about emancipation, uh, I think that, you know, first of all, one thing which we need to do is to, you know, this idea about, which I said that we, we can look at all cognitive practices in terms of either axiomatics or problematics. So, and this problematics that people like they do in the word minor. There are minor, pra these minor practices immediately cannot be identified with, you know, subjugated practice. Now that women's knowledge is minor or uh, Dalit knowledge is minor. But the issue is that can we, how do we look at the minor parts? Can we look at it that they, there is a problematic they set up and they have serious inquiry and research which is not to trivialize the problem in the solution. In other words, emancipation will not trivialize the history of something. Can we come up with a notion of emancipation which will, you know, which will remember every point of the history of suffering, but will not say, okay, you have been exploited, but after socialism, it's all wonderful. If you have a such a day after socialism, then that means, you know, these people were suffering mm -hmm. for, you know, some necessary reason. So now that we have, and there's a reading of Marxism which says some exploitation had to be there so that we can have the, so, but the issue is that uh, at every point in history there is an opening to the emancipation. So we should be able to accept. Now, for example, let me get to tell you Now, if you read Ambedkar, for example, Ambedkar's uh, famous essay on caste in India. Okay? Now, there is a way in which you can read caste question in axiomatics. That you say that caste is a system or it is a structure in order to meet some interest. It's a Brahmin theory. Now, uh, he rejects that thing. The caste is not a system, caste is not a structure, it is not a means for Brahmin theory. So Brahmin simply are not that means. Then he says what happens is then a exogamic society become endogamy as few strategies are used. And in India, this for no reason, these strategies went wide. And he says the caste resulted from these strategies going wide. In other words, what we need is not a solution to the caste problem, but annihilation of a system which which is not just which has no reason. If the scientists can say I can explain caste and say Caste is because of this to serve majority interest. At least there is some reason. Right? Of course, if the majority
majority is powerful, he will say, okay, there is like this, and there are many, you know, some values are good, etc. But he says there is nothing because he uncovers the caste as a problem. And so you don't need a solution to caste problem. Annihilation is not a solution to the caste problem. I think one can think about it, and he did it in the early 20th century by rejecting every sociological theory possible on caste. And you know, he takes the real target. So this way, I think, I think for me, this would be can we think about a direct practice which comes from this realization that caste is a totally contingent, running wild of a set of stupid strategies. Right? And that will now the thing is, then that means every suffering of untouchables, lower caste, etc. has no reason to be there. He says there's no reason. And that is the way one justifies. Now the theory justifies. Okay. We will not propose a solution by which we will narratively give any cover in the terms of I mean that's the way I would like to do this. And then how does transdisciplinarity respond to amateur curiosity? Uh, on the ground, like if we consider, though you had spoken about it at the onset, uh, uh, the two, like the academic, non-academic divide, uh, could we consider transdisciplinary studies as a move to like disciplinize the kind of amateur curiosity uh, that like, people take to? Uh, I'm just wondering around this. If you could question about transdisciplinarity means very careful, right, uh, studies, because what is the idea of disciplinarity, then you have interdisciplinarity, then there is this question about transdisciplinarity, right. So, uh, my only worry about trans, right, when you say trans, you set up a certain overhanging conditions, right. You will say that, look, you know, for mathematics you interact with say, another domain, we can set up some transcendental conditions of possibility for all future interactions, right? which I think we should cover. So in that sense, that you know, if trans, if there's an opposite, say something like empirical, I would say empirical disciplinary, right? You do it when you have, that's what, you know, in fact, I wanted to look at another case of my favorite case of an amateur is a tractor. Right? Somebody you go for amateur mountain. So there is a certain way in which you go to training, you do preparation, but then you get a certain opening to the immediate get the felicity of the next stone's turn. You develop a certain, uh, you know, into that. That's a very empirical attention to that. But the professional mountaineer is not like that. He knows general cases of things and all that. There is an amateur factor is open to the next stone turning. But of course you take many things. You don't take a very risky routes and all that. Right, because you don't have to prove anything to anyone. So in that sense, and I sort of wanted to discuss this case of Namjogi Singh's exact humanity, because the way we looked at, for example, we looked at something like Vaisheshika thing in order to formalize Indian parliamentary debate. Can we have a theory about Indian parliamentary debate or you know, looking at some question in So some specific act thing is not, it's not invoking something like, you know, we say in Indian relations, there is no division between mind and matter, right? In the West, everything is gone wrong, you have this trans category, then you think, okay, we will come a solution, right? Then immediately something in the West says, oh, who said here also we all knew that mind and matter are not separate, our thinkers have been struggling so many centuries trying to overcome it, so big deal, right? We also, so in that sense, I think we need to be attentive to this empirical places where you can make a cut. Right. So otherwise I think the question of transit is this, if we need to really think about how do we think about this. But definitely this whole idea about you have to be transdisciplinary, you have to get grounding in your discipline and then we will need to sort out a commonly accepted problem. Right. That's not the way. Look at the way economists made inroads into you know, the financial market. Right. Not economists. Right, people, knowledge made. It is not done by economists. People, you know, in the 80s, lot of engineers, mathematicians get into it. They said, look, our economics, we can just pick it up in, 
you know, few days, right? But we have a practice with it's one no big deal in you don't have to go and learn economics or so many. Uh, so that was about economists, but it's also important that we historians, people in literature, philosophers go and do some physics and maths, right? And we often it's only too complicated, we can't do it. Can we now it's already coming up, you know, courses like now online we can do courses and develop basic competence in many Hello. Uh, 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 okay, sorry. Uh, I was saying that I'm not satisfied with the phrasing of my own statement. Uh, please pardon me. I, I wanted to know about the nuances that is possible between care and curiosity, both terms that are being used, along with politics. Politics is just sort of a very wide covered by definition, uh, any attempt at changing society. Now, um, this, the moment we talk about these things, um, that aren't you um, playing into the hands of the frame? Framework in the sense that you can even claim that you are talking about uh, politics of care. And uh, if you put it in terms of some empirical evidence, the 20th century scenario, literature and social sciences, is rampant with these kinds of uh, attitudes. And all I can remember right now is Malambo communicating saying that I'm neither an IAS nor a PhD. I'm a total of that seems to be um, denying the framework that is available for intellectual search for. Um, uh, I think there are two types of, of uh, rejection. One is the rejection by the initiator, the present acceptance, and also by somebody who is a pandit. Very confident of his own or her own place, uh, and in that he or she is not in the inclusion structure. You can also find such evidences from outside, so for instance, in the late 18th century, Goa, there is a, in 1945, his um, statue was unveiled in. Then called Punchy, and as the greatest son of Goa. Um, he's the, supposed to be the inventor of hypnosis, uh, of hypnosis. Um, he was professor of hypnosis in the uh, University of Minnesota, in France. And it's a very, very colorful life, dealing with very rather very different. In fact, he was. Uh, he was involved and expelled from Goa for leaving a revolt against the then uh, Portuguese administration. And went back to Europe. Uh, he is from Goa. He goes to Europe. And um, he appears in the French um, uh, Revolution on the 
How do you talk about the uh, politics of uh, uh, care? Okay. I think there is now, uh, there's a lot of work now, especially the feminists are doing on the politics of care. Right? And uh, in tension with the politics of justice. Right? The formal ways of axiomatics within which we now think about the distribution of justice. Right? And uh, the other kind of rocks and things, so under which we talked about reservation, etc. Mm -hmm. right? There is a powerful critique of that whether we can talk about. That I would say that an axiomatic way of looking at justice. And the other one is the question about care, which is not under those ax axiomatic, but respond to issues every day in the, uh, you know, in the certain institutional context and social context, and so. And what kind of a knowledge somebody has in doing this respond, response to that? And you must have heard about the famous experiments by Paul Berg where they created this moral development of the psyche and said how the procedure of justice is the highest development of the And communists really tore it apart and said, look, all your case studies were are than white women, men. And if you actually take uh, other instances you would have found in entirely different context and situation of. So now people argue that even to understand how discover scientific research is happening, we can't do, do it under this axiomatic and the notions of justification which we had, but we need to go for other ways of, you know, epistemology, which is fair based and the, right? So that's where we need to bring in this question of curiosity. I said that curiosity also need to, we need to think about an inner restraint to curiosity, so that it doesn't become very gossipy and get into all kinds of debates and etc. How do you think about an inner restraint of uh, curiosity? Where it's not, so we don't have other things like, you know, the, whatever got to the mainstream or the axiomatics have uh, ideal essences outside and or some method for us. None of this can actually, right. For uh, somebody who is caring and also curious, your outside reality is in terms of problems, right? not in terms of possible uh, answers. So that way I think it is the question of care we need to very carefully open up, right? in tension with our notions about, contemporary notions about, you know, procedure of justice as fairness. We all want to have a society where everybody is treated fair. Right? Now, is that an adequate politics? And there will be more nuanced approaches needed and how curiosity. I think that's the way we should handle also what we discussed in the case of the man's secretary, we can develop it. And that very interesting new point, uh, point you made about modern things, the shared me and Sunday. Right? That's a very interesting way to face, and I would say that an uh, amateur is, will stay away from both these positions. Right? He is not a Nishedi in the sense of, uh, he is not, uh, you know, criticizing, rejecting, rege criticizing always say, okay, what are the basic condition under which certain things are formulated, so you have to be worried about. Criticism is always worried about some sanctity about the boundary. And always saying, oh, you really, and you can expand this notion of boundary in any sense. Uh, whereas, uh, Sandeli is too sure about himself. And you know, when the amateur, amateur is all the time aware about its imperfection. 
right? You always have the professional great musicians who are singing so well, great painters who are doing it. He goes and copies it. He knows very well that he can never aspire that uh, situation. Right? So he cannot be temporary. And since he doesn't want to totalize the field of knowledge and say, here is the boundary, right? And I am going to either stick to it or I am going to jump out of it. He doesn't say that. So it would be interesting to use the two suggestions you made and think about. Is there a position which is neither Nishedi nor Tandedi, nor a kind of a compromise between, you know, uh, these two. Right? So neither Nishedi nor Tandedi nor somebody under the burden of creativity. Right? That's not quiet way. It's basically the thing from quiet way in which we want to do things with some love and seriousness. Right? That's all that we are uh, trying to and I think uh, the, uh, the question about uh, the, the colonial <coughs> today we need to, uh, once we have a different description about the scene of knowledge, I think we should be able to rethink all these, these steps that change in the African place. We often we have a certain idea about contemporary knowledge and then we project it into the past and then try to think about how to so then we worry about, okay, we have some powerful numerical calculations, but never showed any interest in translating into a geometry or geometry series. So then it is about, there has been interaction between these two cultures fairly significantly, and so you know much more than I know. So maybe this kind of a clarification is to get the process of the people that we entered into this. Dr. Anima, Professor Sanan, my colleague Shiva, dear colleagues from the university, outside, and my dear students. I've been interested with the formal duty of water plants, but before I go on to this, there's a small digression that I'm going to take. Yesterday, the Forest Department of Kerala State announced the State Wildlife Award. And it is with great pride and, honor, pride and honor and happiness that we here announce that, I mean, this was announced earlier, but to our student community and to the university community, some of you might have known, that Srijit K, who is our research scholar of the Department of History, has got a confirmation prize. For his short film, Sridhar, may I have you here? I request Professor Michael Darwin to give hand over this small bouquet as a sign, as a sign of our appreciation. I'd also like to uh, announce that he is also the recipient of the KCHR research. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Okay, let me go on to the duty that is entrusted to me. As Shiva and I are also fa fa formally part of the KCHR, it is with great happiness that I stand here to say thank you. Thank you, Professor Sanil for giving us this wonderful lecture and making us think about uh, amateur uh, historical writing dichotomies that we generally have to face at this point of time. It was indeed, uh, uh, you put in a new light through it. We have always thought about us as professionals who are the, are the ones who had the methodology with us to do it and, you know, especially given the politics and the times, we generally tend to think of them in a very different light. Thank you for at least making us rethink on that assumption. 
Um, and thank you, Adanima, for taking that initiative to bring Sena here. Thank you, KTHR. And uh, we always hope that as we have been part of KTHR uh, and his initiatives, as Shiva said in her welcome speech, we also hope that this continued association will continue further in the future programs. Uh, no uh, such talk is uh, uh, fulfilling without an audience like you. And 